he's going to be sharing a bit about his thesis research and the work that he's done at Montpelier. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, we're going to spend about 40 to 45 minutes having a conversation with Chris about the archaeology of the temple area. Um, and then we'll do a wrap up with a 10 to 15 minute audience Q&A. And if you have questions for Chris, I would encourage you to put it in the chat. Um, that's going to be the best way for us to keep track of those questions. And we'll make sure that we follow up with him so that all of those questions get answered. So we're going to start delving into this conversation by talking about the landscape itself. Um, I think it's first and foremost important to understand kind of the spatial layout of the site because where structures are in the space has a lot of layered meaning and implications regarding the power dynamic between the enslaved people, the Madisons, and their guests. And so Chris has put up a slide here um, of what the site looks like today. So you'll see the South Yard where the enslaved people who worked in the house would have lived. There's the Madison House itself, the large brick structure, and we've also got the temple. Um, so you should be able to understand a bit more where the temple is located in relation to these other structures. And it's important to note that the landscape, the way that you see it here, is reflective of James Madison Jr., who's the president and father of the Constitution, um, during his retirement years. So it didn't always look like this. Um, it's actually Madison's grandparents, Francis and Ambrose Madison, who first acquired this property um, in 1723. And it's their son, the president's father, who's also James Madison, James Madison Sr., who inherits it from his mom, Francis, when she dies in 1761. So James Sr. has enslaved workers um, build this large brick house in the 1760s, so right after his mom dies. Uh, and this is what that space would have looked like at the time. So in addition to this large brick house where the Madison family lives, there's also slave quarters to the south and a blacksmith site to the north of the house. Um, and it's this site, the blacksmith shop where Madison Jr. will build the temple. And you're not able to see it quite clearly from this picture. Um, you can see it better in this one. So in the former slide, it was showing you one of the kitchens that was near the house. Um, and this is a better representation, the slide you see here, um, of what the site looked like during Madison Jr.'s era. Yeah, thank you, Chris. So James Jr. is going to alter not just the house itself. So he's going to build onto that brick house his father had the enslaved community build originally. Um, and he's also going to alter the landscape. And the temple is a really important part of this alteration in the landscape. So Chris, could you talk a little bit about the background on when Madison is building this temple and kind of what's going on in his life at this time period? Absolutely. Um, first off, thank you, Katie, for the introduction and giving us some of that background. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, so just as some additional context to what Katie was talking about with these landscape changes, these are part of a general shift in landscape design at Montpelier, kind of around 1809. So this is the early 19th century, and it's around the time that Madison is president, specifically when he is president. And you see this shift play out, and we've, we've discovered a lot of this through the archaeology, and you can see it a lot represented in artwork representing Montpelier but it's what's called a shift from the Georgian style of architecture and landscape design to the picturesque. And that picturesque is really about this sort of attempt to make the built landscape look as if it was kind of naturally occurring, um, as if it was always there, even though it was extremely manicured. There was a lot of effort put into uh, maintaining these landscapes and also creating them um, through extensive amount of moving soil and stuff. And we're going to talk a lot about that later. But these landscapes, although they look natural, they are, in fact, highly curated. And the reason this is this plan, um, this intended plan to kind of redo the landscape is that Madison is looking forward 
um, in time to the period of time in which he's going to be retiring from politics, or at least perceived as retiring from politics um, and the national stage by becoming more of an entertainer or host. So the Madisons being very well plugged into national culture and high society, they're going to be having lots of individuals, um, both politicians, um, architectural designers, uh, foreign um, emissaries, and major figures hosted at Montpelier. And there is this desire to have Montpelier represent the latest trends in um, the layout, what was seen as part of elite society. There's this want to portray outwardly their class, their status. And in many ways, this knowledge, portraying their knowledge of what is uh, favorable amongst the elites, especially over in Europe. Um, and you see this is becoming quite quite the norm. Um, Jefferson and Madison and many others are changing their plantations in order to reflect this picturesque design. Um, so with that, the temple is part of that landscape. The temple is in many ways a garden gazebo. I uh, don't know if I can, sorry, I was not at the right. Um, slide there. Um, the, the temple is a garden gazebo style. Um, it's a Palladian style architecture that was really common in Europe increasingly throughout the 18th century and into the 19th century. And American architects and landscape designers and Madisons, they're very familiar with this and they're wanting to recreate this on their landscape. But what's fascinating about Montpelier specifically, their temple, that was built here is that it hides a 24 foot deep ice house, uh, brick lined ice house below it. So there's this sort of marriage between the um, utilitarian need of having an ice house. Um, and I'll talk more about why they needed that in a minute, as well as this uh, trendy uh, garden gazebo that would have communicated um, their knowledge of the latest picturesque design of what was trendy and popular, um, as well as providing a, a respite for guests and visitors to hang out on, um, provide views of that picturesque landscape. And in many ways, it was part of showing off Madison's wealth to, to these visitors, um, his knowledge and his wealth. It was, uh, necessary in order to do that. Interesting. So it sounds like Madison is changing this landscape from kind of his father's layout that he had this Georgian style with a focus on symmetry to this natural looking picturesque style in terms of enlarging the house, building the temple and kind of reordering the landscape. So what does all of that tell us about how Madison and his guests are perceiving enslaved labor at this time. Yes. Um, so before I get into that, uh, specifically, there's, and it's, it's linked to it, is the exhibiting control over nature. Enlightenment thinkers, um, scientists, politicians, there's a certain uh, effort in both experimenting, but also exercising their power and control over the, the, the natural landscape. And that is included from farming to a garden design, um, as well as these, these highly designed or curated landscapes. And with that is the need to create or control view sheds. So I mentioned visitors wanting to uh, kind of having a leisurely time at a temple. Um, the temple almost serves as a panopticon of sorts. Panopticons are very prevalent at the time architecturally and in multiple levels of design throughout the 19th century. Um, that's a whole uh, another uh, kind of topic that one could discuss. But in general, there's this desire for Madison to control the view shed of visitors. So in many ways, what you can see here in this photo or that this uh, digital rendition, as well as this photo from the 1890s, um, I want to turn your attention to the pine alley specifically. So that's those two rows of pine trees that are coming off of the main house. When you're a visitor approaching the house to Montpelier at Madison's time, there was the desire to have this continuation of almost the pillars essentially 
of the front portico extending into the yard space towards the temple. And that pulls your eye specifically to the north side of the house, to the left. And it also intentionally is pulling your eyes away from the enslaved community. And I think that more addresses what your question was getting at. The south yard, which is the area off to the right pictured here, was purposely blocked from view with a cluster of trees. Um, let's switch slides here. I, was, I, I skipped, um, I feel like I skipped something. Okay, here, I'm gonna probably be bouncing around this PowerPoint in various orders um, as we converse, but this quote I've included and, and this painting from the time really exhibits that intention that Madison wanted his visitors to perceive. There was this desire to have enslaved spaces be partially hidden, not fully hidden. There was a concern amongst guests uh, to know that they were going to be comfortable. So that's what this quote gets at here on the page, that they wanted to see the presence of slavery enough to know that they are going to be tended to in their needs. This was also a representation of Madison's power, his wealth, and his ability, both Madison and Dolly, uh, to support as good hosts their guests. Now, they were also aware, many of these uh, politicians, uh, like Lafayette, who often tried to persuade Madison against uh, the sort of immorality of slavery, some of them were aware of its ethical questions. And so like in this quote, Johnston discusses that even though he wanted to see it, he didn't want to see enough that it would conjure ideas that were to him, as he puts it, not so dainty, uh, that he didn't want to be confronted with the difficulties, the ethical difficulties and hypocrisy of slavery itself. And you mentioned that the temple also serves as an ice house for the Madisons. Mm -hmm. So it's this spot of leisure, but it's also an ice house. So how is ice being used by the Madisons at that time? And what importance did it have in their daily lives as well as kind of inter entertaining guests? I'm sure they had a lot of guests. So what, what was important about that? So uh, I've included here the, the slide that shows the 20, it's a pro cross-section profile of the architecture of the temple, as well as a photo from within the depths of the ice well. Um, and just to, to show that it's there, but this, this size of this ice house is intended to hold a lot of ice, but there was also, you might, I don't know if, you probably can't see my pointer um, at all. We can <laughs> a little sure. bit. You can, okay. So there's this dashed line um, that's uh, somewhat down from the actual floor of the temple base itself within the ice wall. And this served as an antechamber. So the antechamber would have almost been like a refrigerator. Uh, so we do know documentarily, there's a quote from Aisley Payne, who was an enslaved woman here at Montpelier. And she recollects storing various meats in the ice house. There's other uh, quotes from neighboring plantations that talk about storing cream in the ice house. So we know that there's due to the um, sheer amount of visitors and guests and the parties and barbecues and Dolly's famous squeezes that there was a need for both food for entertainment. And so having this antechamber or this refrigerator would allow you to amass food prior to these events um, and make them last much longer. And also having ice, um, we'll skip a couple slides here. Um, ice was seen by Madison as ha being almost a necessity. And he, he comments on just generally to uh, on others in his class that ice was a necessity to daily life to them. Um, many guests to Montpelier commented on the frequency with which ice water was served to them, that they had ice cream served, chilled wines, um, and this was just seen as part of normal life. We, we know that um, there was an ice house in Washington in their time in Washington as well, and ice cream and chilled wines were being served at that time. So it, being able to extend the, uh, in his retirement, extend the same quality of life, um, the same sort of level of entertainment to 
um, his retirement was seen as important. So ICE does play an important part. Here's uh, some artifacts of the ice cream making process uh, from the 18th century, as well as some of the presidential ice serving vessels that would have been in possession of the Madisons from the time. So you reference, so the food, the drinks, ice cream, potentially. So the temple is functioning as a really important structure in the Madison's kind of entertainment. Um, I'm guessing it's not Dolly who's running down there to get the ice or the food. Uh, I, I'm assuming it's the enslaved people who are doing that. So exactly. can you talk a little bit about, yeah, what labor is involved with that? You know, what's involved with them? Not just, you know, in the building of the temple, but, um, you know, kind of the construction as well as the use of it as an ice house. Yes, absolutely. So in addressing, I'm just going to jump some slides. Before I really kind of address the role of ice house labor and what that looks like, um, and it's important to note that from all the documentary quotes that we have, most of them are told from the perspective of the Madisons as well as their guests. So when they're talking about being served ice cream or chilled wines, in some of those quotes, they sometimes mention an individual's name. Um, I can actually go back here. Um, like this quote from uh, Margaret Smith, she mentions uh, a woman named Nanny called, uh, called me to breakfast and brought me ice and water. There's other um, examples of named enslaved individuals. So we know behind these events of these elite guests being able to enjoy ice, there is a story of an enslaved laborer, a person, and the work that they were doing. But before I really get into that, I do kind of want to back up and talk about the landscape. I know we talked about the picturesque landscape already, but it's really important to note here that that, that picturesque landscape required removing a lot of spaces previously present on the landscape. As Katie mentioned earlier, and she showed you that 3D rendition, rendition there was a kitchen, there was a, an ironwork site, and I have it marked in this area in red. We haven't actually found archeologically the structure for that, but we have found all the materials related to that site. And we have to understand that with decades of individuals living and working in these spaces, there are going to be past ways of life. It's basically makes up a black geography. It's a, uh, there's stories and life ways associated with this space that were entrenched. And in order to create this picturesque landscape that Madison wanted required removing those buildings. So slave laborers would have been instructed to remove their, their homes and their spaces of labor and move them somewhere else on the plantation. And we have found some of those sites. The South Yards construction also occurred during this time of the picturesque redesign. Um, we know the blacksmith was moved elsewhere to the home farm right across from the overseer's house. Um, so there's a lot going on here, but the main thing here is to, to understand is that there's a disruption to this space in order to create that landscape that Madison wanted to portray his power and control over nature, which was also evidence of his control over the enslaved community um, and decisions he was making at their expense. So, but we do want to understand here with all that, that when we understand or try to get at the experience for enslaved laborers when they're conducting ice house labor, whether that is um, domestic enslaved individuals, enslaved chefs and cooks, um, those doing the butchering and possibly storing the meat in the ice house, um, as well as those actually harvesting the ice. There is a context to that, that many of these are the same people who lived and worked in these spaces and were part of the demol demolition of those spaces. So there, there's a, an important concept in historical and archeological theory that when we are coming and experience a space or any landscape, we're bringing to that in momentary experience with us, all of our past experiences 
both as an individual elsewhere, but also within that space. Um, so if you imagine, say, when you're going to work, you take a certain road and for whatever reason that road gets closed and you take a different path to get to work, that changes your your personal experience of uh, coming to the same space. So we we want to understand that there is here, uh, what I have pictured here is actually um, this thin layer that's covering the whole site beneath all the landscaping fills. That is the is a historical sealed record of life prior to the creation of the picturesque landscape, that the enslaved laborers creating it would have had to clean all of that up and dig through it in many ways doing the archaeology of their own lives. And so we need to really kind of understand that there's an intimate relationship between the dirt and those actually digging through it. Um, not to sound too hokey as an archaeologist since we dig dirt all the time, but it's it's really an important thing to ground the humans and their interaction with the earth and how meaningful that can be and sometimes traumatic um, as well. Um, let's see, did I address your question fully? I Oh, yes, I do want to talk about the actual tasks themselves. Um, okay. All right, so one thing when we've done the archaeology, it it revealed, so we did archaeology around the main house. You can actually see all this in orange is excavation units that we placed. So we haven't excavated everything around the structure. It's all been very limited in scope, but it's actually been quite revealing. We've identified a fence line that we believe would have continued, and that's based off of, again, I, I apologize for flipping through the slides here like this. Um, this is actually a sketch from the 19th century that shows a fence here with a gate. You can actually see the ice house entrance. Um, it's very important to note here that this, this is the entrance in which the ice was being deposited into. Uh, and it might be hard to tell from this picture specifically, but the ice house road um, was at a significantly lower grade than the lawn of the main house. Um, so uh, up where all these shovels are in this photo is more similar to what the grade of the lawn is. But the, the, the base here where we have these two retaining walls is kind of where the road would be. So it's not a, a full doorway. It is a partial doorway. But there is a purpose here in creating a lower entrance to the ice house rather than having it up on the platform of the temple. It was a way to hide that labor so that it wasn't in view of the house. Um, and that was purposeful by the Madisons. Again, that sort of tied into the same thing is they want all the benefits of having ice at the ready, uh, but they don't wanna see the labor associated with harvesting the ice and packing that into an ice house. Um, from this, this photo that you see, um, the ice pond, which has been modified in the present a bit, but there was actually a shallow obsidial pool, uh, to use fancy words, but it was a it was a kind of protrusion from the pond, and it was a place where the enslaved laborers would have actually been heart dragging the ice in. So someone was probably going out onto the ice, cutting it. That would have been brought into shore using pole hooks. Um, broken up into smaller pieces and loaded onto a cart or wagon. And then where I have highlighted in orange here, you can see we, can, we found this from the LIDAR data, which is laser surface scanning. It's been phenomenal for really understanding this plantation landscape and the many things that are hidden in woods, um, such as this road. But this, this road here was actually the ice pond road. And again, I'm gonna flip slides. So they're actually going out on this pond and harvesting this ice, which I'm guessing is very dangerous. So it's not just about the labor. I'm, I'm assuming there's some danger involved in this process. Absolutely. So, um, and I, that'll, yes, absolutely. So when they're going out onto the ice, there's always risk. We have quotes, not from Montpelier, from other plantations, including some oral histories from the early 20th century of those who were doing this kind of work in the 19th century. Um, especially on farms. The late 19th century ice uh, industry was huge compared to what was going on on these plantations. Um, 
with modern refrigeration and stuff like that. But in any case, there was always the risk of falling in. And it's really important to note, I mentioned there was a desire to have this task hidden. One of the things we have understood is that, and there are some documents from, I believe, Shirley Plantation that talk about this, the task would have been tried to be completed all at once. So you are waiting oftentimes until the ice is frozen at least an inch thick. So it can actually be quite thin. Uh, so the ice cracking and you, the risk of you falling through is, is higher if it's thinner. But Jefferson has, has written down specifically for his ice harvesting, or that, the ice harvesting that was done on his uh, plantation, that they would have waited to at least it was an inch thick. So there was this was quite risky. And in order to get this done as fast as possible prior to the ice melting, they would sometimes, every enslaved laborer on the plantation, sometimes even neighboring plantations, would converge on the source of ice to complete the task as quickly as possible. And many times this was done through the night in as many loads as it took, um, especially if there were moments where you, the weather, the season's weather, the winter might not have been that cold. They might not want to wait until there is another freeze that may or may not come. There are several quotes from Madison that talks about this kind of anxiety about whether or not there would be enough ice to be to harvest and fill the ice house over the course of the winter. Um, but again, yes, you're right, Katie, that the risk of falling through was uh, was very real. And um, kind of going back to this road, we actually found wagon ruts um, right outside the ice house entrance. And this this picture doesn't really portray it very well. I can go back. This one actually has topographic, excuse me, topographic lines on it. And the slope is quite steep, running off the ice house road right out outside of the ice house entrance. So you have to imagine carting horses, pulling wagons full of ice, and you're trying to turn those around to back them up to the ice house entrance to push the ice down into the depths of the ice, ice well. Um, I have some pictures here um, of this process as it would have occurred. And so the ice is getting dumped down. And what we know from the time period that there would have been enslaved laborers down at the depths of the ice well, battening the ice, packing it, um, because ice actually will be less prone to melt if it, you reform it into a mass. There's less surface area than if you have it kind of haphazard in chunks. So imagine um, for the enslaved laborers down in the depths of a 24 foot deep ice well, in the freezing dead of night, the ice is getting dumped down on them. They're probably backed up against the wall and then trying to batten it down and pack it as quickly as possible until the next load comes. We know that there is risk of the ice house uh, antechambers collapsing as they age. Uh, Washington talks about that in letters to his overseer related to his ice house. Um, so th this is a dangerous task. It is not a pleasant uh, task and it would have involved a lot of people um, and slave laborers from across the plantation. Um, so it's it's easy to kind of look at the plantation in like a little microcosm of individual households or sections. So like the main house, the domestic and slave laborers, the field laborers, but and really many of these tasks and ice, ice labor specifically was one in which um, the enslaved laborers would be coming all across the plant from across the plantation to converge on this one task. Um, well, it sounds like there was probably skill involved in it too. And I think that's kind of one of the things we don't talk a lot about when we talk about slavery and enslaved labor is that there's actually a ton of knowledge and skill that goes into most of all the work that they do. So mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing that's part of this process as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, as I pictured here, this is this one doesn't really get to show it all that well, but we do know that there were enslaved laborers within the main house grounds, uh, particularly on the regular basis, especially um, when there were large events, specifically uh, enslaved chefs who were highly skilled, highly trained. We have to understand they're cooking foods and preparing uh, these meals and entertaining um, for high society and the amount of skill and years of experience and the 
sort of oral tradition of teaching that skill generation to generation and um, to multiple people, that is something that gets lost a lot of times. You know, we can talk about 24 foot deep ice wells and the kind of magic of that. Uh, it was seen as sort of this magic curiosity to people even Madison's time, but there is something behind that. All the bricks for that well house or for the, the, uh, the ice well were made by enslaved laborers. They would have known where the best place to harvest those clays were. Um, they knew the soils here. That I do want to talk about specifically when I was talking about dirt. A 24 foot deep ice well is no no joke. That's a lot of digging. As I can attest to digging in these soils, they're they're hard to dig. Um, any other people who have dug here know that. Um, so they would have been digging through. Yes, Katie, you did uh, field school in 2017. Um, digging through heavy clays, uh, a lot of rocks. We, in the landscaping fills around the temple, we uncovered a lot of these large stones and these interesting clays. Uh, you can see in this, this is actually one of the pine tree hole removal holes from the pine alley that I talked about earlier. And this blue yellowy mottled clay here, this stuff is wet, retains water, it's, it's gross, it's not fun to dig. But there's something important about it. It doesn't really grow, um, grow well. It's not a great lawn topsoil. And other places in the country where there is exposed blue clays, grass doesn't grow on it very well. And the enslaved community would have known that. And at first, when doing these excavations, we didn't really think much of the soil. But when you observe it, the red clay here, I don't know where my pointer is. Okay, there we go. Um, there's this red clay, which we know is from, is redeposited landscaping fill. It's all, this is all on top of, you can see the black lens from the 18th century is on top of this blue clay. Now, as the enslaved laborers are digging this 24 foot deep ice well, they're actually going to be digging the red soils first. And as they get deeper, that's when you start to encounter those blue soils. We call them glay because they're a greenish gray clay, um, sort of the jargon. Um, but in any case, what we've actually, and so if you were digging out and you were just piling the soils out, you would actually see the red clay deposited first, and then the deeper soils as you're pulling it out would go on top of that. What we have seen here is the what we think there's this um, area I have kind of south of the temple where we had this uh, set of trench units placed where there was a separate deposit of the blue clays from the rest of the landscaping directly around the temple. What I think that is was the enslaved, because we have to remember they're moving tons of soil. There's irrigation ditches being dug all over the plantation. There are wells subfloor pits for their dwellings, construction of the main house itself and its cellars, um, digging the ice pond, which was an, quite the endeavor, ditching, ditching a natural stream to fill that pond and having a dam, putting building ornamental um, islands that were in that pond. Those are no longer there, but we know they were there um, in the Madison era. But basically we think, uh, I think that they were staging the soils based off their type so that they can then use them depending on their characteristics when re-landscaping the lawn after the temple was con completely constructed. And that was in order to have the final product of a nice manicured lawn to fulfill the creation of the picturesque landscape, that if there were blue clays directly on as topsoil, that grass would not have grown there very easily. So that's an immense amount of what some archeologists call vernacular knowledge, this sort of generational knowledge and decades of like working in the soil. And this is very closely tied to class too. In our society in general, we don't frequently think of farming and, um, irrigation or manual labor as skilled labor, but there's a lot of knowledge and skill and talent in doing that. And just because it's written down, not written down doesn't mean that it isn't skilled uh, knowledge. And it requires a lot of training, a lot of experimentation, and just years of doing it um, that I think is really important and often 
often lost. Yeah, no, no, thank you. I think that's such an important um, piece of the story that we don't really talk about is that, again, that skill and that knowledge. Um, and so I kind of want to pivot a little bit because I know we've talked a, a lot about what went into the construction of this um, ice house or temple and how it was used. But I'm wondering if you could briefly tell us a bit about the symbolism behind the temple. Um, and I know that there's probably a lot. That's probably a very big question to answer in like two or three minutes. But can you oh, just two or three minutes? That? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess so. You want to talk about the symbolism specifically? Yeah, yeah, just so, like it meant a lot to Madison, I'm assuming, but I'm sure it meant something to the enslaved people too. So if you could kind of talk about those differing perspectives and how they would have interpreted this space. Yeah, definitely. That's we know for it's hard to get at this question of how did how did the Madisons and their guests view the temple, um, specifically in terms of its symbolism. They're highly symbolic structures. And because Madison isn't writing specific quotes about what it means to him, and it's it's just as hard to get at it, if not harder to get at it, from trying to understand what the enslaved community uh, thought about the structure. But we know that it's a building imbued with a lot of meaning, and I'm going to talk about that. So, and that sometimes those ideas are contradictory and complex. Um, but so to the Mad Madison, we do know that th we have this quote from him. Uh, he's writing a letter to Jefferson, and he's talking about universities as temples um, to as a road to liberty, that they're basically houses of enlightenment. Um, there are symbols that are quite prevalent and sometimes tied to universities. We also know that in the 18th century, specifically the late 18th century, around the time leading up to the Constitutional Convention, that there were these um, this influx of the use of temples and imagery specifically around liberty, as well as constitutional government. Um, so we, there's this parade float that I have here. Um, I'm going to skip to this slide, actually, it's better. Um, where it's a what's called a monopteral style temple. So this, the temple at Montpelier is a, mon, a monopteros. It's an open air temple supported by pillars. And this one is supposed to be a temple of liberty. And it's supposed to represent the two things uh, that the constitution with 13 pillars representing the 13 states uh, coming together to ratify this constitution that would be forming this new house of government uh, this new nation. So the temple is kind of symbolic of the nation itself, of constitutional unity, and also liberty. And there's a lot of symbolism specifically around Lady Liberty um, in her temple of liberty, if that makes sense. Sometimes she's called Britannia or Columbia, but oftentimes she's represented holding a spear with a Phrygian liberty cap, which harkens back to the Roman era, where um, the Phrygian cap would be given to an enslaved person who, and that would represent their freedom. So liberty was, you have a lot of this symbolism, which is really interesting, where the temple is tied to liberty, liberty and liberty is seen as specifically in emancipating uh, enslaved peoples. And Madison and, would have understood that. Like he would have known that's what it meant. Absolutely. And so I, in this, these two pictures and, and the parade, there are a lot of parades in Philadelphia around the time of the ratification where in the parade, they're, they're kind of floats and there are actors portraying people from around the world, um, oftentimes stereotypical, as well as enslaved individuals who are, um, I'm probably going way over two to three minutes here, uh, who are supposed to be seen as coming together in this new nation to achieve liberty. Um, and it's supposed to be like in the photo on the left, regardless of class, even though you can see in this photo on the left, it's all white men. Um, but there is this sort of tension starting to happen in the country over the concept of liberty and who that belongs to. Um, we have um, adopting that same symbolism, we have 
For example, on the left here, this is a frontispiece to a play that was written about a slave trader kind of realizing their wrongs and pleading to Lady Liberty to forgive him and to emancipate those he enslaved. We also have on the right here um, from 1792, a frontispiece to a kind of early suffragist or proto-suffragist um, magazine that was actually given out in uh, with uh, Wollstonecraft's book, um, who was also kind of a suffragist, a proto-feminist. Um, so there's using liberty and liberty temples to indicate that there's this concept that it should be expanded beyond what the framers of the Constitution ultimately restricted to white male landowners. Um, so many. And this liberty temples get used all throughout the 19th century, specifically around the issue of slavery and abolition. You see it featuring in uh, political comics around the fugitive slave law. It appears on pottery, um, kind of critiquing the British Empire and how they are not spreading liberty to the world despite their promise to spread democracy. It even reaches the Capitol building uh, or the Capitol in the 60s uh, or the might be the 40s. Um, there, Jefferson Davis, the future president of the Confederacy, uh, was charged at that time, this is prior to the secession, with overseeing the redesign of the Capitol. And there was this uh, opportunity to put a statue on the top of the building. And the first uh, version of it, Lady Liberty is depicted, which I have on the left here, she's depicted wearing a Fijian Le Liberty cap, uh, which to Jefferson Davis was appalling because to many um, in power in the nation, uh, they did not think or want the nation to rep be represented by this idea of emancipation and ordered the redesign of that statue, which is ultimately what we got uh, a Lady Freedom uh, statue who is depicted more in a kind of uh, war regalia as opposed to being an emancipator. So it's kind of interesting there how their immense levels, but I think, and it continues on through the Civil War, but one thing I do wanna kind of touch on here is coming back to Montpelier now, that this idea of temples, um, we don't know specifically that Madison intended the temple at Montpelier to be a temple of liberty. There is a watercolor and there is a quote that refers, there's a quote that refers to it as a uh, temple with a, a Liberty statue on top of it. There's also an early watercolor that shows a Lady Liberty statue on it. However, we've done architectural analysis and there doesn't seem to be any evidence of that being there. So we're not 100% certain, but again, it's very prevalent in the symbology and culture of the time. So Madison was very, likely very familiar. His guests were most definitely familiar with this, but I want to get at the enslaved community here and what they thought of the structure. And I would argue that they were very aware of its meaning. We do know from, and it, we don't have quotes that talk about this. This is where the archaeology really comes in here. We have artifacts like this Liberty pipe bowl, like this Masonic pipe bowl, um, specifically that show engagement through material culture with these larger concepts beyond the plantation. Lady, and they were, these were important personal items uh, to whoever used them. Um, there was this important moment specifically, uh, am I doing okay on time, Katie? No, but Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, if you want to just wrap this up, we just have one more question after this. Okay. And then we'll do the um, I want to talk about this pipe bowl specifically. It was a Masonic pipe bowl. And during the excavations in the South Yard, it was actually uh, being conducted uh, in conjunction with descendants. So those are descendants of the enslaved. And when this pipe bowl was uncovered, there was an assumption amongst the archaeological staff that this was something that either Madison uh, or his guests would have had and when they were strolling throughout the South Yard, perhaps. Um, however, it was immediately noted by the descendants that no, their ancestors were part of Masonic orders. And there are historians like Ira Berlin who have talked about the importance of uh, Masonic or fraternal orders in general in 
enslaved communities, as well as emancipated African Americans in the, the Federalist period specifically. And so this, and a lot of times these Masonic lodges or fraternal orders are also abolitionists and they're spreading pamphlets throughout plantations about uh, these ideas of abolition. And we know there are um, famous abolitionists like Frederick Douglass who frequently refer to temples of liberty and the irony of enslaved peoples wanting to run away from the temple of liberty. So referring to the nation itself from the plantation, from the constitution towards actual freedom. But so we know that these people are engaging with these ideas that frequently historians have and museums and archaeologists have long sometimes assumed were only within the purview of the Enlightenment thinkers like Madison and Jefferson and those of uh, white society. Um, and ultimately, that is an injustice to the intellectual knowledge and capabilities of the enslaved community and what they were engaged with and informed about and talking about amongst themselves and across plantations and sharing these ideas that were very uh, important to them. And so I would, I would argue that the temple would have been understood for what it was. It was an irony that it was representative of constitutional government. It was representative of liberty. But yet beneath it was a 24 foot ice house where there was hidden enslaved labor that was created in the spot where there were previous sites of, of living and working um, that these individuals would have been very aware of and understood that irony um, that the, the like in many ways, the nation was built by the enslaved um, the Constitution was only able to be written in many ways because of the systems of enslave, enslavement. Um, and they would have understood that and understood that the temple was um, kind of had a different, more complex meaning than maybe a guest to Madison would have conceived it as. Interesting. Yeah, no, thank you for kind of elaborating on how it would have been viewed by both both parties, both the Madisons and the enslaved community. Um, and so I think this is a good point to turn it over for audience Q&A. Um, and then uh, if we have a little bit of extra time, Chris, we can kind of follow it up with maybe more of the modern interpretation of it. Okay. Um, so if anybody has questions for Chris, um, please put those in the chat. Um, I see we have one. Um, from our friend Patrick. So Chris, it looks like you may want to flip back to a slide where it actually shows one of the landscapes, the one of the Madison Jr. era. Um, Patrick's question is, Chris, related to the temple, if you could, one of the slides showed the picturesque balance to the temple in the form of a vegetation feature. My belief is that the feature was not boxwood grotto that we see today but it was in the same spot. Do you know what the landscape feature equidistant from the front door to the south of the house was? Yeah, I think it's that slide. Yeah, so uh, what Patrick is talking about here is off to the right, right at the edge of the, um, it's like actually extending from the grove. We don't actually currently know. There's been, we've had architectural historians studying the plantation who kind of had that interpretation of the Boxwood Grotto creating this equidistant uh, design that was parallel with the temple and the center of the main house. So there's this balance, um, despite the picturesque sometimes appearing a bit random um, and not overly symmetrical, like the, the, the pre-existing uh, Georgian landscape, there still was this symmetry kind of hidden within the sort of naturalness. We don't know if the Boxwood Grotto was there or not there. Um, we would need to do more archaeology. We have done a lot of archaeology, both in the Pinalay and the Grove area, which is the cluster of trees that was planted to obscure the South Yard. Um, but we would need to do more investigation. There is evidence of brickwork inside of the grotto. Um, but like I said, we would need to do more excavations to understand that and what had been there prior. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we're 
still waiting on some folks to put questions in the chat. Um, so please do feel free to take advantage of Chris's expertise on this topic. Um, but in the meantime, Chris, I just want to kind of address something that um, we didn't really get to talk about, and that's interpretation of the temple today. Um, mm -hmm. And so, as you know, Chris, I come from the public history world, and yeah. You know, one of the major tools that public historians rely on for best practices when, you know, interpreting slavery at a plantation site is this rubric of best practices in interpreting slavery at museums and historic sites, which is a document that was put together in 2018 at the National Summit on Teaching Slavery, which was hosted by Montpelier at Montpelier, kind of in partnership with the National Trust. Mm -hmm. And it's this document that was really the first national interdisciplinary effort to formulate a recognized model for best practices when talking to descendants and engaging about this interpretation. So I'm just curious, how is this being put into effect in regards to the temple? And you know, what interpretation is happening um, with this site now that we know that it's, yes, a Madison structure, but also very much used by the enslaved community as well? So we're actually, what's presented now to the public is still kind of a holdout of Madison's intentions of this picturesque landscape. The temple is the only extant structure other than the main house itself, which although it was modified, it's the only extant structure from the Madison era currently to exist into the present day. And the landscape associated with it, i.e. the Pine Alley and the sort of North Yard, that overall design has been maintained into the present and has also continued into our interpretation um, and even more so. So the ice house entrance, if any of you have come, it's the it's still hidden in many ways. It's in fact buried. Um, the owner, subsequent owners to the Madisons brought in extra fills. There's a long history to it, but basically the temple's ice house entrance is sealed up and covered. So it's not visible at all. And the visitor path, um, for visitors, it doesn't actually extend all the way to the temple. And there's signage that's kind of in the middle of the yard. So some, some visitors don't actually walk all the way out there. Um, when we were excavating in the Pine Alley, um, a lot of times people would be surprised to learn that there was a, an ice house under the temple um, and because it's not being represented. And I think in order to, and there's there's been a shift in general in museums and archaeology and history and trying to pursue a um, what's some kind sometimes called a decolonial or decolonized interpretation or an anti-racist interpretation that it's repopulating the stories of those enslaved laborers or those on these landscapes, and that even though Madison intended there to be a a white landscape, a privileged viewscape for visitors to see that hid the black presence, um, they were still there. And there's lots of stories to that. So there's still a lot of work to be done on telling those stories, but this presentation is an example of trying to do more of that, but we need more signage to tell that. We need to actually restore the ice pond road. Um, this is just my opinion. <laughs> Um, as well as the ice house entrance, so we can really show more of bring to life the sort of tangibility of what that labor looked like in the landscape. And to do that right, we really need to have descendant, um, not just input, but uh, decision making in the, cre the recreation and reinterpretation of that space to tell those stories fully. Uh, so this rubric is is a major part of doing that, um, and there's still there as we've seen there's so much history to this to the temple, um, and I didn't even really talk about how the Madisons were using it all that much as well as the ice house, um, that just so many stories that aren't being told at the present. <laughs> Sounds like you're going to have to do a part two of the evening with the experts. <laughs> Maybe only, if only if the people want it. 
Well, thank you so much. I wish we had more time to talk with you because I'm sure we could just go on and on, but um, there's so much to learn about this project and the enslaved community at Montpelier. So for those curious minds eager to hear more about these stories, uh, please check out the Montpelier Archaeology Department blog, Digging Deeper. Um, and that's a great place where you can find out more about you know, what Chris is doing and what the other archaeologists um, at Montpelier are up to. And I just want to thank you, Chris, for your for your time and your expertise. And um, it's just been a, a really engaging talk and um, something I didn't really know that much about either. So thank you. And um, we've actually got another, our final evening with the experts uh, series this year. Um, it's with Leslie Boudery. She is the visiting curator of collections and she'll be doing a talk on December 9th at 7 p.m. about the dining room. Um, there's a fabulous new installation that the um, curation team at Montpelier have put together. And so uh, Leslie will be looking at um, how dinner with the Madisons would have played out. Um, it would have been a very complex and impressive affair involving a cast of important players. So those hosting the event, the Madisons, their guests, as well as those enslaved people who would have been the ones serving this meal. Um, again, kind of to what you said, Chris, all this, not just labor, but the skill and the knowledge that went behind that. So it's going to be a very interesting um, installment and a great kind of end to this series, especially going into the holiday season. So thank you all again for attending this evening. And uh, if you have a moment in the near future, we'll be sending out a survey, just asking you some questions about how you like the event. So we would very much appreciate your response to that. So thank you again. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you again, Katie, for hosting. And thank you all for joining.